from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Today. Coming up on Ag Day. We're willing to try something new and if we can. A family farm not just surviving, but thriving. Why more Americans are switching from chicken to beef. And talks to end the trade war continuing to move forward. We are now communicating at all levels. And that's a very good thing. Ag Day, brought to you by the Chevy Silverado, the most dependable, longest lasting full-size pickups on the road. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. The U.S. now communicating at all levels with China on trade. That's the word from the top White House economic advisor. Larry Kudlow, the president's national economic council director, confirming there will be talks between the two leaders at the G20 summit in Argentina later this month, saying trade will absolutely be included in those discussions. Bigger and broader issue is China has high tariffs and high tariff uh, or non-tariff barriers on commodities, you know, industrial supplies. So, you know, I could go on and on, but those are some of the key points. And we are going to talk about that now and at the G20. Kudlow also addressing comments made by Peter Navarro. That's the president's trade advisor. Kudlow said Navarro misspoke Friday when he said Wall Street was pressuring President Trump to make a trade deal with China and that the financial sector should retreat. China's top pig farming company announcing it will make changes to lower protein and animal feed. A company executive with Wins Foodstuffs Group telling Reuters about the changes, but it says the impact on its operations would be minimal. We told you last month China was making major changes due to its ongoing trade battle with the U.S. China's Feed Industry Association approved new standards lowering the protein levels in pig feed by 1.5 percentage points and for chickens by 1 percentage point. A major trade deal in Southeast Asia is on hold, at least until next year. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership is focused on free trade between China, India, and 14 other regional economies. The RCEP would involve 40% of the world's trade. It does not, however, include the United States. Singapore's Prime Minister is saying progress on the agreement has stalled, and so far, all sides are struggling to bridge their differences. The goal had been to finish the agreement this year. African swine fever, apparently not in Chinese animal feed. Reuters reported earlier this week, Tansgren Shin Group said one of its units was contaminated. Now the company says tests on the feed have ruled out the presence of ASF. In a statement to the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, the company reported feed samples contained suspected traces of ASF. It said the feed was manufactured by a subsidiary. The Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs has reported more than 4,000 swine deaths from ASF since August. USDA rolling out its harvest update, crop progress a day late due to Monday's federal holiday. It puts corn harvest at 84% complete. That's three points behind the five-year average. Soybeans are now 88% cut, five points off the average pace. And winter wheat planting's also still behind. 54% of that crop rated good and excellent. We're finally getting some good news about those massive wildfires burning in Northern California. A fire official saying crews are getting some help from cooler weather and diminishing winds, and that's helping to stop the spread of a fire that's killed at least 48 people. California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection spokesman saying the blaze has charred 210 square miles. You're looking at what's left of the town of Paradise. The fire, now one-third contained, aircraft, including 21 helicopters, are helping in the effort to halt the fire and destroyed 7,600 homes. The crew say smoke is heavy and low to the ground, and that could affect visibility and hamper their efforts. Kids can make harvest pretty memorable, right? Meteorologist Cindy Clausen has more in today's crop comments. Good morning, Cindy. Thanks, Clinton. Well, kids and harvest can make for a fun combination, just like in this photo shared with us by Devin Drake in Stuttgart, Arkansas. Just look at that face and the old Choi John Deere tractor. Maybe that tractor just isn't moving fast enough for him. I don't know, but that is such a cute photo for sure. Well, let's take a look at the wind forecast today. We're going to be seeing some windy conditions in parts of the east as we have a low pressure system that's moving up 
into the northeastern United States. Also some windy conditions, especially in the western lakes and into the northern plains. As we head through the day, you can see those winds really starting to pick up in the northern plains and the mid-Atlantic will be the other kind of focus for the stronger winds. As we head into the overnight hours, you can see where a low pressure is going to be moving through the Great Lakes and then into the day on Friday, we'll start to see those winds picking up again in the plains, but especially we're going to see uh, windier conditions in the eastern parts of the Great Lakes. I'll have your national forecast coming up, but for now, here are some hometown temps. Keeping track of the shifting market prices has never been so easy. Get the latest commodity prices sent directly to your cell phone with market updates. Just text MARKETS8 to 31313 to get started. Count on your Pioneer team to bring local knowledge and insights. Year after year, Pioneer is committed to the success of every acre on your farm. Pioneer, with you from the word go. One farm family in the southeast is making sure its operation stays resilient, and they're doing that by keeping true to southern staple crops while leaning into diversification. Betsy Gibbon has this Farming on the Horizon story from North Carolina. Picking corn is just the beginning of harvest for the Warren family in Newton Grove, North Carolina. We have about 1,500 acres of corn. 2018 may not produce their best yields following severe weather, yet that's okay. The Warren family builds its success on being diversified, and that often includes technology. It's always kind of been a, a principle of our business that my father and uncle have always instilled in us. You know, it's, it's good not to put all your eggs in one basket. Bartley Warren is the fifth generation on his family's farm of 7,000 acres, which has been operational since 1974. Don't count the other generations out. All hands are a help in the partnership, from his father to his uncle and cousins. We all kind of have our niche in the business, whether that be the grain or the hogs or the tobacco, sweet potatoes. You know, we all kind of do our part. So everything's good to go now. Yeah, we got that includes his brother, Brandon. We're not running a research farm. We don't do things just for the sake of doing something different. You know, we're willing to try something new and if we can. The Warrens believe there's a right way to be diversified. They have a system where they can see the yield monitor on their iPads. It also includes seeing which crops should be planted in certain soils and how plant populations impact yields. We've also kind of changed the way we do our soil sampling and um, our planting with variable rates and fertilizer and that sort of thing. With that information, the family sits down each year, looks at input costs, and evaluates acreage mix. We've kind of kept our tobacco and sweet potato acres, you know, at the same for the last couple of years. But, you know, if things continue to change, you know, with uh, with China or, or other aspects, um, you know, we may have to reevaluate next year. And like this year, we upped our cotton a little bit because the price of cotton's come back a little bit. It may be good Warren did. The family is still harvesting cotton, a delay after Hurricane Florence hit. However, his yields are better than he anticipated, although he does not know the grade. The tobacco and sweet potatoes, which are his cash crops, both big losses. The markets are bad, or if you had a bad year, or you yield, you know, hopefully one thing can make up for the other. Diversity may be the secret of longevity for this southern farm. I could see the passion that my father and, and uh, others have put into it. As they stay true to their roots, but improve upon them for the future. And I want to, you know, I want to continue for that, the business to thrive. Um, you know, it's just important to me. Reporting in Newton Grove, North Carolina, I'm Betsy Gibbon. Will farmers plant more corn or soybeans next year? Look at what's at play with some analysis coming up. And later, what it takes to grow the perfect Christmas tree or one fit for the White House in the country. Join Andrew McRae for Farming the Countryside, a farmer-focused podcast that is all about production agriculture. Farming the Countryside is available wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and is brought to you by Nutrien Ag Solutions, the world's largest provider of crop inputs and services. In agribusiness, another mixed day of trade. We get details now from the floor of the CME Chicago. Today's soybeans rise, they still stay in that consolidative state. The export ex inspections hit the mark again, and that really gave the market a little bit of a boost. It gives futures a lift, and it actually offsets some of the losses that soybeans have had 
over the past couple of sessions. Corn was steady. The technical numbers were offering a little bit of support, so technical traders stepping in and buying that 50-day moving average, and it's uh, kind of holding. That's the, become the big support level right now. Cattle today was a little easier. The feeders uh, were buying, and that help, helps the, the future. So as feeder cattle was going up, it helped the live cattle market a little bit. There has been stronger demand. That's been helping to drive the market higher, and that expectation is going to go on to the end of the year. Hogs today were mixed. That's all from the floor at the CME Group. Here in Chicago, I'm Virginia McGaffey. Producers looking ahead to 2019 and what to plant. Tyne Morgan has more on the changes we could see in today's analysis from the road. Here now with Mike North of Commodity Risk Management Group. Mike, as we head into 2019 and specifically look at corn prices, there are some bold forecasts out there right now as far as acreage goes that we could see a large jump. However, I'm seeing some, hearing some analysts say, no, I, you know, don't get ahead of yourself. I don't think we'll see that large of a jump. Realistically, what are you thinking at this point? Well, there's lots of focus right now on balance sheets. And when you look at soybeans, we're not only carrying a record supply of soybeans, but a record that surpasses the old record by 311 million bushels. And the reality of that is if we run the numbers on 51 bushel yield, we can lose uh, 6 million acres of soybeans quite handily and still have a record inventory over the 2006 numbers. Wow. So as we prepare for 2019, 6 million acres could get walked off the books on the soybean side, move over to corn, and there too, if you run the average yields at 170, that's a little over a billion bushels of added production that hits the balance sheet. And so when we talk bigger picture in terms of price, we see a future where corn will be the leader, but it can't go very far because it doesn't have to work for acres, and if it goes too high, it'll get even more acres, and that's when things get really interesting. So corn and soybeans are gonna be in a really, really interesting balance play as we go into winter fighting back and forth for acres. So where do you think is a reasonable price for corn there then? Right now, if you look at DS 19, you've seen a lot of resistance just over $4. I think that's reasonable. North of $4 gets just enough acres, but not too many. And I think downside is we go through winter and we play against Argentinian production because they're off to a great start. They've right. got good weather. Right. Uh, that could invite some lower prices down in the 380s as we go through winter. But the reality is that's a 30 cent range. You know, 380 to 410 uh, would not be out of question as we go through the winter. And then as we get towards spring, weather, planting intentions, all that will start to uh, play a factor on where we go from there. All right, Mike North, thank you so much. Let's take a quick break and then we'll be back with much more right here on Ag Day. Cut through the uncertainty in the markets. Give Mike a call at 608-764-0012. You could win a Ford F-150 Raptor in the Ag Explore Truck Sweepstakes. Enter at trucksweeps.com. Welcome back to Ag Day. Your meteorologist, Cindy Clausen. Cindy, uh, saw some stats that said we're off to one of the coldest starts ever for November. I believe it. And just look at the map. We have Absolutely. snow and freezing rain and sleet. Look at that. Uh, and it's not that we never see these things in November, but it's kind of early for some of these areas to be seeing some of this kind of weather. So let's go straight to the map. And yeah, look at this. We have snow. We have mixed precipitation in parts of the eastern Corn Belt, but even in some of the mid-Atlantic states as well. This low pressure system is going to move on up to the northeast. Now, a lot of the south and especially southwest, we're looking at dry conditions in much of the plain states as well, especially central and southern plains. As we move this up into the northeast, we see that snow moving up into Pennsylvania, into New York. Closer to the coast, it's more likely to be rain. We have a second system that's going to be grazing the northern tier of the United States, so we'll look for a little snow there in parts of the Northern Plains, uh, upper Midwest and heading into the Great Lakes as well. Heading into the overnight hours, we see that snow, especially into New York, heading off into uh, the rest of New England. Dry conditions for most of the South, and that's going to continue into your Friday as well. There comes that front, so look for a little bit of rain and snow in parts of the Northern Plains to the Midwest, and then again, we're going to watch that low pressure system because that's going to be the biggest wet weather maker. This is the past 24 hours, and you can see many areas had over two inches of precipitation, most of that in the form of rain, obviously. But as we move it up into the next 24 hours, we're going to be seeing 
all of that spreading into the northeast. So yeah, we're going to be seeing all of that moisture and there's a lot of it in the eastern part of the country. Take a look at what we're expecting for snow. It's been especially over towards southern Illinois. That's where the focus has been with that system in the past 24 hours. But when we add on the next 24 hours, you see that really starting to build into the northeast and then into New England as well. Look at that. We're looking at uh, many areas. Our model is showing four to eight inches plus in parts of the northeast and into New England. Here's a look at your temperatures. It's been cold. We're going to continue with the 30s and 40s for a lot of the eastern half of the country. A little bit of a warm up in parts of the Plain States, though. Overnight we go and we'll see those temperatures down into the 30s. So slightly warmer for a lot of folks, especially in these areas and on the back side of that low pressure system. As that pulls away, we see those temperatures warming up. We start to see some more 50s and 60s there. Still 30s and 40s in the especially around the Great Lakes region. Here's your jet stream. There's that cutoff low, but it eventually joins with and mix the trough in the northeastern United States. We'll keep those temperatures cool there. We've got a ridge in the west, so that's why we've been seeing some slightly warmer air in parts of the western United States. That's a look at your national forecast. Now let's check on some cities where you live. Durango, Colorado, sunny and warmer for you today with a high of 54 degrees. Much warmer in Lawton, Oklahoma with plenty of sunshine there as well, a high of 60 degrees. And Dublin, Ohio, look for freezing rain and then rain, high of 36. Like it or not, winter has arrived across most of the country. Are your cattle ready? We'll talk healthy herds next on Drovers TV and later hear the secret behind growing the perfect White House Christmas tree. All in a row, a new resource for crop and farm management information is brought to you by Farm Journal and Valent USA. We're moving into the season of cattle care, and it's about so much more than getting animals vaccinated, as one veterinarian tells us. Beef with plenty of competition in the meat case, but word now, more Americans are switching from poultry to beef and pork, driven in large part by price. Hefty tariffs on pork and growing domestic supplies leading to cheaper prices at the store. Rabobank says with those falling prices, consumers and retailers are choosing to buy and feature more beef and pork and less poultry. There's a lot of choice, and so as a result, um, the retailers are opting not to feature chicken as frequently as they have in the past. There's been a lot of beef features this year. You've seen the big burger features over the summer at, at food service, and that hasn't helped the chicken industry. Now, with prices so low, the industry is really hopeful that we'll get some of that back um, because you know it's attracting the attention of food service. The Kraken says the price per pound for chicken breast hit an all-time low last week. In 2019 demand will depend on the strength of the economy and if people are still willing to pay for that pork and beef. Coming up, what does it take to grow the perfect Christmas tree? One that will take center stage at the White House. The answer may surprise you next.
in the country, sponsored by Kubota. Discover the power behind the M6 series at Kubota.com or visit your local Kubota dealer today. What does it take to raise the perfect Christmas tree? Apparently, according to the man who raised the tree destined for the White House this year, you basically abandon it. Larry Smith grew the Fraser fir that was selected by White House officials. The 19 and a half foot tall tree didn't seem to be doing as well as others, so Smith says he hadn't trimmed it in a couple of years. But he says two White House officials, quote, just love the natural look to it. Smith's mountaintop Fraser fir farm was selected to provide this year's official tree after he won the National Christmas Tree Association's contest in Wisconsin. Smith's win bolsters North Carolina's tally as a state with the most White House Christmas trees at 12. The tree is now on its way to Washington, where Smith will present it on Monday. Very nice. Congratulations. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. It's been part of your day with us from all of us here at Ag Day. I'm Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day.